Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 375th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we've got a young buck named Carson Cook. And I'll just tell you right here in the beginning, there's a little bit of language. Not much, but I'll tell you the, um, the name of the journal. So if you've got delicate ears listening, have them cover up. But it's called No Shit Sales Journal, a confident, common sense, and practical guide to sales. This guy hit me up online uh, through social media, actually, I think, and uh, mailed me his book. He lives overseas. He's an American living overseas in a unique place. I've not had a guest from over there. So uh, I gave him a shot, and uh, I think it's a good episode. Got some good info. Uh, If you missed the last episode, 374, Dr. Stanley G. Robertson, check it out. He's the quit doctor. He says why you need to quit, why it's a good thing to quit. And, you know, it's an interesting take because we keep hearing how you just keep, stay at it. Thomas Edison, you know, 10,000 times figured out how not to do a light bulb. And like everything, there's, there's truth in both sides of the argument. And um, he's got an interesting take, Uh, former Marine, PhD, smart dude. We had some technology issues, so, of course, Air Force had to rub it in on them. But um, smart guy, good guy, um, good info. Uh, Coming up next, 376, Michael Fossey. He is actually with my sponsor, Rainmaker. So we get into the specifics and the nuances of recruiting. So check out their offer at thesaleswhisper.com slash recruit. Uh, If you are in San Francisco and New York and you are looking to get a great sales job fast, check them out. It's free for you to use if you are a company looking to hire someone fast. Uh, Michael shared some numbers, and it's over $2,100 a month you are losing when you don't have a salesperson in a seat if their quota is $750,000 per year. Okay? So... Every day, that's what you're losing. And they chop about 20 days off of the average search. So that in and of itself will pay for any fees. Uh, And they have a great replacement guarantee. So check it out. TheSalesWhisper.com slash recruit. They've got a special offer uh, for listeners of the podcast. And um, it's worth checking out. Again, especially if you're a company, you know, good grief. Um, And next week we'll talk about it, but they have a unique process where they confirm intent. And even though I was a recruiter for a short time years ago, and we talk about that, uh, it's an interesting concept. You know, is this person just kicking tires? Are they just trying to use your offer to get a better deal from where they are? So they have a way to figure out intent pretty accurately. You know, is this person really looking to move? And that way you're not wasting time. And as a candidate, your info is released in batches every two weeks. So your info is protected from your current employer and your previous employer. I still don't quite understand that, but that's okay. They don't think you're bouncing around. That's fine. Um, And but you're released every two weeks. So the companies have to be ready to bid on you because they know others are queued up, teed up, ready to go as well. Just like on eBay, you know, I had to teach my kids, list something for a dollar, right? And, and I do a short listing. You know, I'll do a three-day listing on something. There's no reason to go seven or 10 days, or whatever. You know, if people are truly interested looking for that item, they're going to pounce on it. And so same thing here. Every two weeks, these companies know there's new talent coming out. And if they see someone they like, they're going to act on it quickly. So both sides win. All right? TheSalesWhisper.com slash recruit. Um, speaking of salespeople, sharpening the, the sword, sharpening, you know, iron sharpens iron. Uh, got some new members in the 30-day sales growth program. So that's the good news. The bad news is the price went up again. And I've been talking about this. I, I'm adding more and more content. I just added... I think it's 10 pages of notes and content just on how to get referrals. Okay, this is not pie-in-the-sky stuff. This is stuff I've been teaching and applying to my own business um, and teaching it for 13 years. Really, in my own business for at least 15 years, you know, when I was still a W-2 salesperson. Uh, So 
it uh, the core of that came over from the original 30 day sales growth but I'm, i spent a week updating and adding new content to that one module so it's um it's super current and in the group you can ask any question you know if i'm not at jujitsu or i don't know where else asleep about the only places you know maybe church you know if i'm not somewhere like that i'm online i'm helping to answer questions you know i've got a few private coaching clients i don't take on too many at a time a i can over deliver that way i make myself un- available in unlimited fashion you know reach out to me call set a time text whatever so i'm there for my private clients but uh, i don't take on too many so i can give of myself that way and the the cool thing is once my clients get on a roll i help remove the big obstacles they're pretty self sufficient and they're happy with that that means i have time to answer questions in a group so if you're looking for practical real world proven no bs sales training help come join us 30daysalesgrowth.com uh, when you join now even though it's a hundred dollars more than it was last week it's still a one-time payment uh, as i build this out by the end of the year it'll be an annual payment of even more so it'll be a renewal but you're going to be grandfathered in okay so come join me come hang out let me help you i'm happy to do it 30daysalesgrowth.com now let's bring on our guest carson cook you are a first in two ways. One, you're my first guest calling in from Katmandu. And you're the first to uh, vape during the interview. So well, <laughs> sorry about that. Do these first, uh, man. How the heck are you? <laughs> first, first. Not too bad, man. Not too bad. Just uh, just rocking and rolling in the office, having a good day and you know, trying to get things rolling. So for for our listeners, I usually remember if we got any potty words, but uh, we'll we'll warn them again up front. There'll be a couple potty words because you wrote a book that you sent me called Mm -hmm. No Shit Sales Journal, a confidence, common sense, and practical guide to sales. What the heck, man? What's this all about? (laughs) Well, it kind of explains it in the first part of the book, actually, believe it or not, that, you know, um, I use the word no shit sales to kind of get a little bit of attention. Obviously, it's kind of a thing that's going to spark a lot of interest right off the bat. But the first part of the book actually goes into the study behind trust and profanity. Um, You know, it's simply the fact that we have a, you know, a background on taboo words, and we kind of hold people that use profanity in a lower level, I would say, or a lower caste system of everybody else and being non-formal during the sale when it actually turns out that people that have a comfortable situation with their clients sometimes will use profanity to kind of spark more trust or build more rapport. And there's actually studies out, which kind of are you know, directed to in the book, that people that tend to use profanity actually are seemingly more trustworthy than those that do not. Um, but that's just kind of one of the points of the topic of the book that starts off that you know, kind of shows that there are a lot of things in sales uh, that I would say in particularly that, um, you know, need to be trained a little bit better on, you know, I would say just basic communication stuff that you would learn in, in, in school and high school and be obviously if you were going to go on to higher education, if there was such a thing for sales, it's not sales and marketing and, you know, it'd be a college course. But other than that, that's, that's kind of the reason behind the title of the book, you know, get some attention and realize that there are some things in sales, even if you've been in sales for 40, you know, 20, 30, 40 years that you might have missed out on, um, you know, that, that might spark some interest. So, so that's why. So you're saying there are studies. So they've studied mm-hmm. salespeople with potty mouth. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't just say uh, salesmen with potty mouths. I'd say people in general. They took a group of, uh, you know, a group of people and, and did surveys on trustworthiness. How would you appear trustworthy? And those that actually used profanity had a better impact on people um, and their in their communication with appearing trustworthy. Uh, not necessarily saying that they were not trustworthy or not, but those that actually do, and I wouldn't say all the time. I wouldn't say that, you know, you should go to a sales meeting and, you know, use profanity, cuss, and, you know, become that kind of a person. But if you'd like to emphasize a point, I'd say that there is a place and a time inside even a same-day close portion where you might throw out, a, you know, a word of taboo that might spark interest or, you know, kind of, you know, if you're on that comfortable level with your client, which, you know, is your goal, you want to build up that, you know, build up rapport and trustworthiness as fast as physically possible, even in a long sale. How do you know when it's safe to use profanity? (laughs) 
I would, I would say it's, it probably has to go um, off of experience. Obviously, if you don't use profanity in your sales pitch, I'd say you're probably not going to use it the next time you, you go. But you know, at the end of it, if you know, if you, if you, if you feel like that customer is now your friend and they, you know, you feel comfortable putting your arm around them or they feel comfortable putting your arm around you, you know, maybe let one go, maybe let one go and see how they react. Um, believe it or not, that's kind of a, you know, treat a client as if they were your friend. Treat a client as if, you know. Let one uh, go. Are you talking about uh, uh, cutting the cheese, man, or dropping the No, oven? no, no. Maybe, I would just use it, <laughs> use it a swear word. I don't know. Maybe using it, like I said, maybe using a word of taboo to emphasize your point. I mean, the thing is with profanity, I'm not a big fan of profanity. That's not what I'm advocating for. I'm just advocating that there are, in the book, it kind of goes into other ways or other, other situations where, you know, um, we've been taught not to use profanity with the sale because it's not formal. Well, sometimes you don't close the deal because you're formal. You close the deal because you're, you're in a connection with your client. You're face-to-face. They trust you. And, you know, if you feel comfortable with a friend on the weekend and, you know, doing, doing this or doing that or, or, you know, you let something slip, I mean, even – you know, even, even, uh, even my, my wife will hit her head and she'll say shit, but you know, other than that, she wouldn't say that in front of her parents, but she'll say it around me because she's married to me. I don't think there should be any difference between that and, you know, um, feeling that comfortable around a client, the more comfortable you are around a client or in a sales presentation or a pitch or, you know, hell, even on stage, as you know, um, it's going to get the audience and the people involved and engaged more trustworthy of what's, what you're saying. So, and that's not what the whole book's about. Obviously that's just the first part. Um, there's not a lot in here on profanity, but it does get the attention. <laughs> so what else, what else is common sense in sales? Because I, I see most salespeople do not have common sense. Um, you know, we right, just yeah. bought a Tesla and, Very nice. but I looked at other cars. I looked at the Chevy Bolt. I looked at uh, Hyundai has come out. Uh, they got a little Kona. They got the an mm-hmm. Kona. Uh, yeah. It was actually a decent car, but I mean, the Chevy Bolt, the Chevy sales guy, he was younger, but not a kid. Yeah. I mean, he was probably early thirties, old uh-huh. enough to know better. Uh, total cheese ball. The guy, at, <laughs> the guy at Hyundai, he was older. He's older than me, probably early mid fifties, total uh-huh. professional. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, um, and, I would have bought, if the Tesla didn't exist, I would have bought the Kona, even though it was mm-hmm. a little bit smaller, because I liked the sales guy at yeah. Hyundai dealership, right? But why why are salespeople historically just so bad? I would honestly, to be honest with you, Wes, and I think this is something you probably agree with too, is that, you know, at the end of the day, this... I, I, I look at sales as a profession. It's something that you need to strive as a, as a career. It's not something where you have a bad month in sales. Uh, it's not something where, you know, yeah, I'm paid on commission, but, you know, everybody should be. Um, in my opinion, as a career, the, some of the highest paying jobs in, our, in, 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 in the United States, in the industry, is, is sales. But yet it's not taught in schools. It's not necessarily a subject. When you go into a college and you take a, or even high school, a sales and marketing class, it's not sales, it's marketing. It's doing things to get a customer to call you. But yet we're the infiltry of every major organization out there. We're the ones that are on the phones face to face with clients, which is the first part of a seven second bias or the beginning of the close. So we're the infiltry to the army. And if we don't have a good infiltry, the rest of the army is shut. It's gone. But we don't receive training on it. Um, some of the most sales professionals, like you said, are, I, I would say, cheese balls because they're not receiving proper instruction from, you know, the people from before them, before them, before them. It's all these old dogs with old tricks and this is what works and this is what you need to do, which makes sense. But at the end of the day, you can't, you know, the, the best courses you're going to get are from, you know, Grant Cardone or, you know, some of the other sales gurus that are going to be online. Um, and, and it's the same thing. It's not, I would say that, that we don't receive as much instruction as, as we should, but sales is not necessarily, like you said, you just didn't like the guy building rapport and everything all has to do with more of psychology and base. Um, I wouldn't even say basic, but communication and the side of mentalism and persuasion than it does on, um, you know, than it does on just following a process. So you will have a 45 year old gentleman that has been in sales for so long that, you know, he's not willing to learn um, communication or um, mental, I wouldn't say mentalism tricks, but men, you know, parts of psychology that actually help people make actual decisions. Physical body language is extremely important. And, you know, if they're, they're cheesy because they haven't had the proper training where if you could go through, 
you know, a basic communication course with the psychology backing around it, and then kind of move into, you know, mentalism and communication techniques. And you're going to find one of the best closers or top performing salesperson you're going to meet. And they're going to be a nice person. So I, I think the reason why they're so cheesy is that there's just not a lot of really good content or information out there. And they're definitely not receiving it from their top level performers or top managers. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Grant Cardone. I mean, he's a big potty mouth. Uh, yeah. Tony Robbins. I don't know if he always has, but he certainly is now. Everybody knows mm-hmm. Gary Vaynerchuk. They want to be like him and just drop the F bomb. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. are people forcing it? No, I just, I just don't, I don't know. I, in my opinion, if we're going to go on to that topic, like using, like I said, with the, with the use of profanity, I just think that, you know, um, I guess with, with my generation too, it's, um, it's, it's, it was used so much, but you know, it's used in a way to just emphasize what you're trying to get across or, you know, get the point across, um, you know, and it, and I wouldn't say that it's common or it's forcing or it's this or it's that, but you know, sometimes it does bring a little bit of a shock value to a conversation, which starts the starts the communication process with with a client or a customer that's not willing to break down those walls, and it definitely gets their attention. Right. Uh, so, can can an individual salesperson just ramp up things on their own? You know, do they need a mentor? I mean, if they're in a high pressure place, you know, the company, it's not very conducive to, it's not a nurturing environment, let's say. No, it's not. Uh, do they need to just get out of that environment and go somewhere else? Uh, or can you, can you bloom where you're planted? You can, this is what I would say. I would say that you can bloom where you're planted if you've made the career choice to become a professional salesman. Uh, salesmen that are young and new, they try it because they're money motivated, which is awesome. But you have to look at it like, um, I'm going to do this. This is going to be my career. And if you're really serious about that, then in some of the videos that I talk about too, even in a non blooming environment, you need to put in your work. You know, you need to, you need to find courses. If you need to better your communication, always ask questions. You need to learn the good part about, uh, me understanding the sales game is that, yeah, it's the shark tank. It's the top, you know, the, you know, the always competing, the fighting, the constant battle back and forth and that psychology breeds, uh, you know, um, like the, you know, it breeds a, a, a competitiveness to the point where when I sell more than you do this month, I'm going to flaunt my stuff. I'm going to show off to you. Now what that does, that leaves me susceptible to thinking that I know everything instead of asking questions. And it's really rare to find a sales professional that even when they hit the top numbers, they ask even their mentors, how can I get higher? You tell me they're not very coachable. So one of the best things that I suggest, honestly, if you want to bloom when you're a younger sales professional is find someone that can teach you, find someone that you relate to, but then find the number one person in your industry, find the number one person in your company and ask them as many questions as possible. Follow the number one. They're number one for a reason. Not saying you need to mirror them, uh, but what I'm saying is there's going to be some things that you need to pick up on and realize that, you know, it's always the top one or 5% of sales professional that makes 90% of the money within the organization. And they do it for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, And yes, you might be starting at the bottom. Yes. You might have to work your ass off harder. You might need to, you know, make more phone calls, but you know, if you're making phone calls and you're just doing the wrong thing and the number one person is making just as many as you are and they're selling more deals than you are, they're doing something different, you know? So it's, it's an opportunity for you when you're a younger sales professional to learn as much as possible about your company, your company's process, how it works, but then also do home study. You know, if you really want to make five hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars per year in sales, then yeah, you better do your homework at home. You know, try and find a course, try and learn as much as there is about the sales process as opposed to selling your product because eventually you might not sell that product anymore. Your life cycle, your sales turnover is pretty big. I mean, you might be selling something else. So instead of focusing so much on learning about that product and the company and this and that, you want to learn the process. But I think what you need to do is learn how to sell. Once you can learn how to sell, you can sell anything. Amen to that. You talk about here, you know, rapport uh, mm-hmm. and persuasion, influence. Um, how is the internet changing things and social media changing mm-hmm. things? Is it, is it easier to build rapport? Is it harder to build rapport? Uh, because it seems like people you know, with chat bots and text messaging, Mm -hmm. you know, really kept at arm's length more and more. 
That's, that's exactly right. I think my personal opinion on it with a lot of digital marketing um, agencies that are out there, we actually just started another branch of our office called Centrix Local, which is going to be a, um, basically we have a, a bunch of tech gurus that are digital marketing guys. They're amazing. Um, our guys setting it up. Um, but basically I think the social media stuff within sales does a really good job of almost like how we named this book. For example, you know, when someone says shit, it's a click baby. It's something that someone wants to Whoa, I can't believe you just said that. Well, with social media, that first seven second bias is just to get your attention. But even with automations within click funnels and stuff like that, you'll find out that a lot of it still requires face to face communication. It still requires someone to give them a call, some sort of outreach, which is even what Centrix is, like our, our current company. We're a call, you know, a call center. We reach out, we're on the phone sales, which is still a need. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's kind of made it a little bit more whatever. I mean, and it kind of also takes the idea around, you know, sales professionals, everything's become so automated is my job in jeopardy. And I still think, no, I mean, in sales, there's always going to be some sort of opportunity within the sales pipeline where someone has to be on the phone, has to be selling, has to be face to face, especially when it's something that's a big ticket item. You're never going to buy a corporate building on the internet <laughs> if you've never talked to anyone before. So, right. Um, NLP, I mean, I've, I've read it. I've had a couple of NLP practitioners on the show. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously Tony Robbins took it to a whole new level, kind of brought it mainstream. Yeah. Um, is it, is it a gimmick? I mean, is it needed? Uh, I don't, I don't think I use it. I mean, I've certainly, I haven't studied it well enough to be even what I claim proficient. But I mean, I would, mirroring, yeah. pacing, or whatever. I mean, is that yeah. is it gimmicky? Should we try to learn it? Uh, should we use it kind of like salt, just a little bit to flavor? Should we try to master it? I would say that you know this is a very this especially in this book. This is a very very basic starting sales book. This is for someone that's out there. There's only a little tiny bit out there on neuro linguistic programming, and there are studies on both sides of the fence. They say that there's a lot of people that say mirroring and and doing this this kind of stuff actually doesn't work. And then there's on the other side, they're saying that you know um, mirroring is actually a you know a a very visual, auditory, and kinesthetic response that the animal kingdom also uses to show hierarchy and authority. So neurolinguistic programming and mirroring, neurolinguistic programming, these communication techniques for me were not were um, you know part of my fascination with communication. It's not necessarily my fascination with sales, but in the book I do talk about some of the the best mentalists that you're going to find out there. One in particular, his name is Darren Brown. He actually is from the UK, um, and he's not in sales, but he's definitely in sales. I mean, he he's what every salesman should want to be. I mean, you want to be like Grant Cardone, and you want to be like you know, a lot of these sales professionals, but when I listen to them speak and I listen to the talk, they, they've done it for so long. They're just the same thing. They're giving you a lot of information. They'll tell you what to do, but they won't tell you why. Now, Darren Brown is a person where he can walk into a room and I guarantee you, I don't care what you're selling. He's going to have a 95% closing ratio. Why? Because he communicates extremely efficiently and he'll tell you why they made that decision. And it's not him persuading them or tricking them. Yes. A mentalist has more than a, the ability to persuade and to actually take this power out of, you know, um, there's actually, believe it or not, there's a really crazy show where he set up this whole thing where he convinced someone, a regular random person, and it, and it was a five, it, they did it five times. It was a trial, but he can, he had, and it was a master show in the UK. It was really, really big, but he convinced the regular general person that at that point it was in their general interest to kill someone. Now, there was a bunch of disclaimers and all this kind of stuff because the lady had gone and pushed the person off the building. Regular person that they picked, right? And this was after four hours worth of a show. But all I'm saying is that that's, that's the power of communication, the power of persuasion can be taken to an extremely dangerous level. But in the hands of an extremely effective sales professional, that's a very, very, very high paycheck. So in neurolinguistic programming or mirroring, I, you know, my thing is that I think that once you have some basic communication skills down, if you're going to choose sales as a profession, you should do some extra study. You should outwork and learn to master certain skills um, that are going to really help you along your way to help persuade more clients. Um, as we see, you, you know, you want to be a mentalist and use your power wisely, but a hypnotist and a, and a mentalist are some of the best sales professionals you will ever meet. And it's because of the well, techniques that they use to communicate. For sure. I don't doubt it. But is it ethical? 
I think with the power, I think as, yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I mean, it depends on if you're an ethical person. I mean, if you're a great sales professional and you learn a lot of techniques and, and, and tips, then, you know, you're, you're either going to be the sleazy cheese ball you were just talking about earlier, or you're going to be a guy that, you know, uh, persuades based off an effective product that will definitely help the client. Um, of course, you know, comes re- with power come and communication comes responsibility. Um, you know, so I, I think it's ethical to learn skills if you want to become a master sales professional, but you need to keep yourself in check. I mean, you don't need to be that sleazy cheese ball. You need to be a, a person that actually helps a customer. I would say that even with these persuasion techniques, the product will never sell itself with them and the bells and whistles and this and that, even if it's the perfect fit and the client will benefit that drastically and they'll get the most benefit from that product, you're still going to need to make them feel comfortable and persuade them into a situation where you're selling the right product to the right person for the right reasons. And if they don't buy from us, we can make them jump off a building. No, I see what you're doing. No, 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 no. Of course not. (laughs) Come on, man. I mean, (laughs) no no jumping off a building. If they're too dumb to buy from me, I mean, they shouldn't even be living. Right. Isn't that what you're saying? Right. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) No, right. I just think, I just think it's just, you know, it's just, and I'm not going to go on a long rant, but I, I just think that, like I said, if, if sales professionals are out there, they're doing their thing, they're running around the lot, uh, you know, they're working in real estate, they're doing that, they, you know, and that's their profession, they're professional communicators. So I think you should learn as much about communication as possible to up, up your commissions as good as possible. But if you, but I do, I do agree with you. If you're selling the wrong product and something you don't believe in then get the hell out of the game, go sell something you want. So let's talk about objections. I have a, um, I've evolved my thinking on objection, mm-hmm. but you're talking about, you know, the, the three D's. Um, yep. Are you, are you aiming for objections? Is that when the sale begins? Do you want to not have any objections kind of def, uh, diffuse everything before it even pops up? So mm-hmm. it's a smoother transaction. I mean, what's your, what's your take on handling objections? I think my, my thing on objections is this, the chapter on objections in the book is very basic. It's kind of some of the firsthand knowledge and a few different techniques that, you know, you can use when you're handling objections, but my actual and full on view of objections could be a whole same thing. It could be a whole nother book is that objections are just concerns. They're, they're, they're concerned. They're not the old view of objections is going after a client aggressively overcoming objections. When objections should be looked at just like a professional shortstop or baseball player looks at a ground ball. Now, um, I, and I don't have this in the book, but I mean, a good example of this is that, you know, if you're, if you're playing major league baseball and you're the manager of the team, okay, or even college baseball, or even at a high school level, you're going to want a shortstop or a second baseman that's standing out there and they want, they want the ground ball. They want the ball. They want to make the play. Now, when you're a kid and you're in Little League, you know, that's the first thing is that they teach you not to be afraid of the ball. You, you don't want the ball. If I'm new to sales, I don't want objections. I'm scared. I'm nine years old in the baseball field. I don't want the ball hit to me because I'm going to get hurt. But you want the athlete or the, the performer out there that actually wants concerns. And you want to meet those concerns with your client. Uh, objections are good. I think objections are, are good because they're an open part of discussion. And once we get to communication – then I get to display my sales tools and my techniques and my, my ways around that objection or my ways with the objection with the client through the objection. And it's just a concern. And if it's, you know, you put your arm around the client and you go through that, that objection and meet that concern and, you know, uh, don't assume communication within your sale, which is what I always like to talk about. So if there's an obvious objection or concern, I like to bring it to the table for my client first. Okay. Cause then I see them, they might have a concern and they go like this or go, Hmm. Yeah, and then they kind of look at me, and you tell that there's not as much rapport there built yet, you know. So I might bring that objection out. I know exactly what you're thinking, client. Um, you know, this is what you're thinking. Most of my clients think this way. Let's discuss this. Let's, you know, and then they go, oh, wow, you knew what I was thinking. Yeah, because I wanted, I want the ball. I want the ball hit to me. I want the objection discussed. Um, I want the objection handled or the concern handled. You know, you call them objections or concerns or, you know, issues. I want it. I want them met together. And then we, we want to overcome them together. And I guess that's the old verbiage too, but um, just the solution, finding a solution to your concern. That's all it is. So you want objections. That's my take on objections. Well, do you, you do have to bring up and address all the concerns, but do you, do you want the prospect bringing them up 
and putting up resistance or do you want to address them before they even come up and negate them so you can just move right to the transaction, to the handing over of funds, right? Like using your baseball yep. analogy, I mean, on the one hand, yeah, a great shortstop is happy to have the ball hit to them. Mm -hmm. But they also know that one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand, they're going to fumble. They're going to they're going to have an error. So yep. I think deep down, the the team player wants the batter to strike out, right? They want the pitcher. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right to just right shut this guy down. I don't, you know, no or maybe pop it up. I don't know. But strike him out yeah. is the best thing. The team wins. The guy for sure does not get on base. Right. You know? Right. So, because I mean, that's kind of how I, I try to anticipate the objection mm -hmm. and address it ahead of time in my marketing, my literature, and the videos that I make, the podcasts yeah. that I make. You know, I, I yeah. want to bring down those walls. So when mm -hmm. we talk, it's basically like, hey, I just kind of want to put a face to the name and, you know, look you eye to eye before I give you my money. I mean, right. that's, that's ideal. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so, I mean, do we want to invite those objections? Cause I always tell people if you're getting the same objection all the time, you're, you're telegraphing it and you're inviting yeah. it, you know, right. and people still bang their heads against the wall and they're frustrated with these objections. I'm like, there's only a handful yeah. you can ever get. Right. Exactly. I mean, I, I think so too. I mean, I, I guess I would say that it really, you want some objections that are pretty common that I would say, because every, it depends on what you, I wouldn't say it depends on what you sell. I would say that, you know, if you're in a certain industry, you know, it's you're and you're, you're in it for long enough and you're selling that product to that kind of client long enough, you're going to say, well, that's my client. I, I, Oh, it's one of those. Oh, that person I sold to, that's one of these. Oh, this one to that one. Oh, it's one of these guys. So it's going to fit some sort of niche. And the funny thing is that in that niche, you're going to have the same, same kind of thing, same objections to maybe a possible part of your product or, you know, a potential service that you offer. And, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes I'd say it's a, it's a combination of both. I mean, you do need to address objections and it's sometimes it's a benefit, like you said, to bring that objection to the table first discuss it, know that it's going to come up with this type of client, get rid of it. And then some you should completely avoid, or even, like I said, use the three, you know, the three, the three um, techniques in the book, either, you know, I completely understand, identify it, overcome it, or completely dismiss it because objections are also, um, um, or concerns sometimes can be used as a defense mechanism from a client. That's pretty obvious. We all know that to where sometimes an, a, a, a concern or objection is just a placeholder for something that they really feel. And you need to get down to that, you know, what they're really feeling so that you can find out what the real objection is. And sometimes it's better with some of those just to, to avoid it. Um, right. And that's basic communication too. I mean, that's not just like you're, you're tricking them and you look at this book and you say, well, some of these techniques are manipulative, but this is exactly what the fascination with sales and communication is in the first place. It has to do with the relationships with your wife, your kids, um, everything you sell all the time, you know, so um, it's sometimes it's better to ignore an objection. It's okay. You know, it's uh, it, with a, even with a customer or to bring it up, you know, sometimes it's better with your wife to discuss something and meet the objection real quick before you get into that fight or and before you, you know, you solve the concern and, and it's not even a thing. It's not even something you even remember, but you did it. Right. Can you ignore an objection? Um, yes. And for example, like an example in processing, sometimes a, a customer will, um, bring up an objection that doesn't hold a lot of weight. It's a concern in their mind that you, you know that they're just making conversation. It actually is going to disrupt the communication within your sale. It's going to kind of derail a little bit or it's going to, you know, tangent it. It's going to, I mean, you can discuss it and explain something, but that line of action, you know, if you've been down that path, might not result in the close or it might not result in, hey, it's been too long and it's just not right. So just say, you know what, don't worry about that. We're, we're going to cover that later. And then they go, oh, okay, no problem. And if you never cover it, the funny question is, if you never cover it later and you end up signing the deal anyway, did that objection really mean anything to you? No, you didn't need right. to cover it. Just ignore it. So sometimes- well, I tell people, you know, don't answer unasked questions. You know, like in real right. estate, somebody, like you're showing a home and somebody goes, oh, these bedrooms are kind of small. Typical realtor right. just starts explaining things, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, they didn't ask a question. Right, right. They just made you, a comment. You know, these rooms are kind of small. So, you know, I might just turn around and say, 
the rooms are kind of small. Yeah. You turn it around on them, right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. The rooms are, rooms are kind of small. That's not too bad. Let's, let me show you this room over here. Let's get them on something else. Now, let me ask you this or ask them another question about something else. Get them off the small rooms. I mean, you, you'll find that out later if that was really important. Well, if it's a real objection, they're, they're going to put their foot down and go, oh, no, this room is too small. No, the, you know, exactly. we have this and that. My husband works from home. We haven't got a baby coming. Then we need a nursery. We need to have a pullout bed and a couch in that room. Yeah. No, this room won't work. Okay, that's an objection. But yes, right. like, oh, these rooms are kind of small. That's not an objection. No, right. And then, and then if, if, you, if you take the bait or you miss the communication, you miss the sign that that's nothing that sh should be of interest or importance to your sale or to helping your customer pick the right place, right? Then you might go down that path and say, oh, oh, it's too small. Let me show you a big one. Why is it too small? Is it, da, da, da. so now, now you've, you know, you, you, you're, you've taken the bait and you've started a line of discussion where now actually, you know what? That could have just been a thought. Now they're actually thinking because you screwed up that it is too small. Mm -hmm. Now, now, now you've just created a fake objection or a non-concerning objection into a bigger deal. And, and right. I, I tell I tell my guys that objections are only as big as you make them. Yeah. I mean, if you really want to cause a problem for your client, then just <laughs> cause a problem for your sale. Just make make their small objections or comments into massive ones, and then you're really shooting yourself in the foot. But yeah. if you treat it, that's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. You know, it's not too small. Then there you go. You know? Yeah. Cool. So how'd you end up in Kathmandu? Ooh, long story. Um, back in 2013, we started Authorize International, which was a, it's a merchant, you know, merchant processing company. And one of the biggest barriers to entry, you get to know a lot of the owners that are out there, uh, guys that own, you know, we, um, we, you know, we still know some pretty big guys that have owned really big processing companies, sold them for millions of dollars. And, you know, with their growing and, you know, their fast expansion, it's a very, very quick, same day close type of sales industry, same day close type of, you know, and quick money. The issue is, is that, you know, when you're growing that fast, uh, the, the biggest expense is marketing. You know, so these guys were spending two, $300,000 a month on payroll just for marketing and we didn't have that money. So what we did is we traveled to Philippines, we went to Bangladesh, we went to India and we looked around and we ended up picking Nepal because obviously it was beautiful and, you know, kind of a cool place. Um, and we just did it. We pulled the trigger. We started our sales organization. We got up to 150 people here in Nepal with five, uh, five, six sales managers, built up a very nice portfolio. We've had some, you know, pretty big business owners over here asking us, uh, you know, for all sorts of different stuff. And that's when we started Centrix a year and a half ago. And now we service them. We've even had some of our ISO owners fire their complete, you know, their, their, their call center to use our services just because, um, you know, it's been beneficial. So for us, it's been really, really cool. Good opportunity too to bring our American sales culture to Asia, which is what I love. You know, I love, you know, some of the, some of the coolest thing is, is teaching people these communication techniques where they just don't, they've never had that, that style and they absolutely love it. Yeah. So that's why, that's why we're here. Very cool. How often you get back to the States? Um, Believe it or not, I uh, go back to visit my parents every once in a while. I have a brother and also a brother and a sister that live in the States. Um, I'd say maybe once or twice a year, not very much. Um, we're pretty, pretty busy all the time. When are you climbing Mount Everest? Um, I have been to Everest Space Camp, but I don't know if I'm going to climb Mount Everest yet. <laughs> Do go to the gym in the morning, get my work done, but uh, I don't know. Aren't, that there, thing is, aren't there like six space ridiculous. camps? Yeah, uh, there's a ton of them. Yeah. yeah, there's the first main one, and even getting to that one's kind of, kind of a task. And then you know, but it, it's really cool. There's a few of these mountains out here too. There's Annapurna, which is also one of the most dangerous climbs. Yeah. Actually, more dangerous than Everest, but it's obviously a little shorter, so it doesn't get the publicity. But it's a so, it's a very beautiful country, man. It's um, it takes your breath away. So to get to that initial base camp, do you have to pay or do you, can you just show up and just go on your own? Like, is it a one day trip sort of thing? No, you can go. I mean, you can get a, you can get a guy to take you up there, but you, it's not like you just like you think, uh, you, you can't just like get on a bus or get in your car or pay a guy to drive you there. Right. Um, you have to fly into a small city and then you have to actually fly into Lukla and go on a, go on a two day, two or three day trek just oh, to wow. get there. And the funny thing is you can't even ride a motorcycle there. Nepalese can't ride a bike there either. You have to fly into this place and it's all village. It's just completely secluded. 
Um, and then once you get there, then you trek and you see Everest Base Camp and you trek back and then you have to get back on the little plane, fly back to Kabadu, and then you can fly out. So it's, it's kind of even a task just to get to the base camp <laughs> that it is to. But so what side, I mean, the peak of Everest is technically in Tibet, right? Or is it? Uh, the... It's all, it's actually all in Nepal. Um, it, you know, okay. it, it faces, yeah, the whole, the whole mountain is in Nepal. Okay. So, and it's the whole, it's the whole range though. And the range is really cool because it goes up into Afghanistan. It goes through down into India and then the top of, you know, yeah, Bangladesh geez. and stuff. Sure. Oh, they're the biggest mountains ever. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, I got almost sort of close to you last year, visited my son in India. We flew up to, Very uh, cool. to Jaipur, kind of in the North central part yeah. of India. Um, but, um, Cool. Does your son, does you, you said you flew there with your son or to visit your son? He was studying um, in India for a semester. So, yeah. Very, very cool. I went out to see him. How did you like India? Flight. Oh, it's very long. <laughs> How big is Kathmandu? Uh, Kathmandu is, uh, it's, it's pretty big. It's, I think it's 1.2 or 2 million people oh, in the wow. surrounding area. It's, it's a yeah. big city. It's, it's the biggest really big. city in, in Nepal. Right. And it still is a little bit different in India, but very, very, very similar. It's a lot, obviously, a lot, cool, uh, you know, a little cooler. It's not as hot as India. For sure. But how did you like Jaipur? Uh, it was cool. It was um, different. A lot huh? of, so much history, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So much history. I mean, touring thing, you know, thousand year old castles and things, you know, just, and I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, I, um, and my son, you know, he wanted to see some different things while I was there. And Hyderabad mm -hmm. is, is very commercial. There's still a lot yeah. of history there. They've got some forts and things and castles, but mm -hmm. um, Jaipur is a little more rugged, you know, a little more in the country per se versus Hyderabad is really built up. Yeah. A lot of technical type companies there. I mean, we were a couple of blocks yeah. from Dell's big headquarters and yeah. Uh, but yeah, you need a lot of time to really take in, any part of India. <laughs> uh, yes. I, I was not there long enough and I, I felt like I was jet lagged half the time. Yeah. It's a big trip. Just getting there. Yep. It's a long, long, long ways. I just had my parents out for the first time in five years. They actually enjoyed it. I took them up oh, to the yeah. mountains and stuff. Same kind of thing out here. They've got like, you know, the, a lot of world heritage sites and a lot of temples and they're very, very culturally centered and it's, it's, it's just, it'll blow you away. It's kind of that weird feeling, man. I love living out here. It's just way different. Yeah. So very cool. So where do we send people, man, and learn more about you? What you're yeah, up for to? Sure. For sure, man. Um definitely. Well I I did the I did this for fun. I kinda do it for you know, I do do videos every week. Um but what I do is uh, I, I I've started the, the weekend thing. So I do two videos and a couple, you know, sales training uh sales training tips, stuff like that. I do have this book. This book's this book you can find on Amazon. Um, you know, the no shit sales journal. It, it is on Amazon. You can pick up your copy nationwide. Um, but the CSO pro.com. So the CSO pro.com is where you go. And um, obviously we have a Facebook and we have a YouTube channel, but the, the main, the main site, everything gets kind of correlated together as you know. Right. Very cool. Well, we will link to that and um, got your book here. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, man. thanks Wes, for having me on the show. If I make it back to your part of the world, I'll let you know. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Draw me a line. I'd love to have you out here. We'll take you around. Very cool. It's a little different than India. You'd love it. You'll love it. Yeah. It's crazy. All so. right. I awesome. look forward to it. All right, man. Carson Cook, all the way from Katmandu, man. Thanks for coming on the sales podcast. Awesome. Thanks, Wes, for having me. Bye. Well, good thing for all my military brothers and sisters about this whole cursing thing and appearing more trustworthy. That's probably true got to say. Um, and I use very little in my business. Um, having seven kids as well, five of them girls. I got to watch my mouth. Also, still got a five-year-old in the house, an 11-year-old in the house. Uh, but even in business, you know, I, I may sprinkle something in now and then, but it's just not my common, normal way. Uh, when I get to Get together with my buddies, college buddies, talking smack on the golf course. That might be a little different thing. Uh, but I've always said, you know, in sales, we have to adjust how we sell to match how our prospects want to buy. 
And like I've always said, there's always two sides, right? Some may say, well, you're not being your authentic, true, transparent self. Maybe. Uh, But in business, my true, authentic, transparent self is to not put up any artificial roadblocks or obstacles or hindrances uh, that might slow down the sale. If I have what someone needs, a service, uh, a software solution, a book, and they are of the more upright nature, if you will, it's not lying for me to conduct myself in a professional manner, in a manner that they require or prefer. That's fine. I'm going to wear a nice shirt. I'll shave. I'll dress nicely. Um, I'll be on time. I'm always on time, but I'm not going to curse. I'm not going to be hung over. Okay. So they are comfortable with me and can see the solution that I offer because I'm not putting up any barriers to that. Now, and look, I'm not some crazy drunken foul mouth sailor anyway. Uh, so, but Hey, guys like Gary Vaynerchuk, they drop the F bomb almost every time they open their mouth anywhere on stage, in person, on videos, you know, he's from Jersey. That's how he was raised. So, you know, it's almost inauthentic if he doesn't do that. So, you know, again, you got to take all this with a grain of salt. You got to apply the lessons that make sense, that uh, work in your situation, you know, but even even in the military, even if if Gary Vaynerchuk never said another curse word ever again, I don't think it would hurt his business at all. Some people might go, hey, what's up with this? I noticed you've, you've been a lot cleaner lately. His the material, the ideas, the concepts that he teaches will still come through. He's still a smart guy. He's got his finger on the pulse of a lot of things. So, but hey, I've always said as well, right? A magnet attracts the same degree that it repels. Howard Stern, Rush Limbaugh, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton. Nobody is on the fence about those people. They are at the top of their games, right? Right? Maybe not Hillary so much right now, but you get the point. She rose to the top of the primaries when she ran. And so they don't apologize for who they are. They don't water down themselves. If anything, they amplify themselves. And they repel people and they attract. So being boring, being forgotten, being out of sight, out of mind, it's the worst thing in business. That's the number one sin of marketing is being boring. So put yourself out there. If you normally, naturally drop some potty mouth words, I don't, you may want to consider using them. Uh, maybe you've been too restrained, too confined, uh, too self-restricting. So Carson and I give you permission to loosen up as if you need a permission. Okay, just get out there and sell something. So I mentioned at the top of the show, the 30-day sales growth program, uh, the price has gone up. It's going to keep going up. So jump in now. Okay, let me help you. Uh, If you need private consulting, hit me up on the website. Okay, thesaleswhisper.com. Go to the Contact Us, and you'll get a link to my calendar. If you need a speaker, I'm still fresh off my Jacksonville talk. Uh, They want me back next year uh, in Scottsdale. That's always a good sign. So if you've got a sales or marketing conference, a leadership conference, um, if you've got contacts in the military, you want to bring in a veteran that's going to shoot straight with you and your troops, let's talk, all right? Um, HireTheBestSpeaker.com. That'll take you to my new web page for my speaking. Uh, I'll be adding to that coming up, but uh, that is hot off the presses. I'll be adding more more modules, more pages to it, but um It's got a good overview, got some testimonials, some shots, and um, that should help you convince the powers that be to at least start talking with me. Okay? So private consulting, sales training, group sales training on demand, and keynote speaking. I'm your guy. Thanks for listening. Now go sell something.